Hello, my name is David Bruce. Classical music is sometimes presented as a soothing, peaceful genre that you can relax to. Pop open a bottle of Chianti and settle back with relaxing classics at seven. And whilst that's a definition that makes a lot of us classical musicians feel slightly queasy, there's no doubt that there are some pieces of classical music that just radiate a sense of inner peace and tranquility in a way that no other genre of music can quite match. And one of them is Chopin's Berceur's Opus 57, which he wrote in 1844. It's not often that you get a chance to isolate one aspect of a composer's style. Usually melody and harmony are so intertwined that it's pretty hard to separate out the influence of one on the other. But I think this piece, the Berceuse, is one example. The title comes from the French word berce, meaning to rock. And it's well chosen because the harmony of the piece just rocks back and forth for four and a half minutes between two chords, the tonic, the one chord D flat major, and the dominant, the five chord, A-flat major. So this gives us a rare chance to study a masterfully written right-hand line without too much distraction from the harmony in the left. If you were set the task as a composer to write a calm lullaby using just two chords, the chances are you'd stick to something consonant and you'd probably keep the right hand quite slow moving. But Chopin does the opposite, and we'll see that he builds an actually quite dramatic structure and fills it with lots of fast-moving chromaticism and a sometimes surprisingly high level of dissonance. So today we'll look at this piece which has this curious combination of absolutely beautiful complex melodic lines with the very simplest of harmony underneath and we'll see if we can learn something about how Chopin puts his lines together. We'll look at the overall heat map of tension and release. We'll expand on the idea I called composing to a point in my previous video on jazz turnarounds and we'll look at how you can build the most complex textures by layering compositional ideas one on top of another. The first thing we need to talk about is consonance and dissonance itself. Within a tonal piece like this, any note that is part of the chord beneath it will of course be consonant. You might then use a note of the scale, in this case the D-flat major scale, to pass from one chord to the other. This is then the passing note and it's the mildest form of dissonance. If you want to increase the dissonance or the tension slightly, you could make this what's called an accented passing note, which means that it's played at the same time as the chord, so it creates this slightly unexpected tone as the chord hits. But then of course you've got even more dissonant notes which are outside of the scale altogether. Again, these might be accented or unaccented. And Chopin uses both types throughout the piece to create a sense of movement. You can see them straight away in the opening melody. All of these passing notes use just notes from the D-flat major scale, so the level of tension and dissonance at this stage is still fairly low. As the first page progresses, Chopin almost systematically turns up the dissonance one step at a time. Firstly, he adds a second voice, which produces a series of clashing ninths, including this one, a minor ninth. Now again, it's still a note technically from within the D-flat major scale, but it's the most dissonant clash that you can get. Played by itself, of course, it sounds harsh, but in context, you hardly hear it despite the level of dissonance involved. In the next bar, you get the first actual accidental note that isn't part of the scale. Although this time it's on an unaccented note, so it's just a gentle turning up of the dissonance. On our heat map, you can just see the temperature starting to rise a little. 
Then at the end of the next line, you get this amazing dissonance. If you listen to it just in isolation, you wouldn't imagine it's part of this tranquil piece. It's a quite extraordinary level of dissonance for a lullaby. The next level of increase in tension is to start looking at sequences that run over the bar, starting to disrupt or confuse the sense of those ever-present two chords. Chopin creates sequences based either on a falling scale, or a falling series of thirds, or a chromatic line. In each case, these foundation notes have been thought out in relation to the chord pattern beneath. The chromatic scale, for example, is worked out to ensure that it lands on the A-flat in the next bar. And this requires a little sleight of hand there at the start of the bar, skipping over the first couple of notes to ensure that we end up at the right place. And this is what I called composing to a point. We have a set aim, that A flat, and we're working backwards to ensure that we get there. Now the sequence before this uses those accented passing notes, and these ones are chromatic. But then it also includes these quite intriguing upper note patterns to follow. I say intriguing because it's quite hard to figure out exactly how they work harmonically. Some seem to be part of the chord beneath, and others seem to prefigure the subsequent chord. The same is true of this sequence. There's something about the harmonic ambiguity of this kind of sequence that feels fundamental to Chopin's style. It gives what could be a fairly bland and obvious pattern a kind of richness and depth. So, so far we've had a continuous build-up of tension and complexity, but now we reach a moment of relaxation with three bars of pure D-flat major. And here we have another example of composing to a point, only this time, instead of adapting the notes so that the sequence fits, Chopin adapts the rhythm, jamming in these falling thirds to land on the D-flat in the next bar. It's a beautiful, expressive run. And there's a shorter example of composing to a point here, where Chopin uses one of his favourite tricks, holding the upper part of the chord while sliding the notes beneath downwards. And now we come to one of the most intriguing passages in the whole piece. I want to spend a moment trying to understand how you go about composing a passage like this, because it's not something that just comes out of improvisation. It really requires multiple overdubs or overwrites of the same section. First you have the melody line by itself, Then you might add in the chords. There's more of those accented passing notes here and here. And then there's also a more spicy accented passing note with these E naturals here. Finally, and most ingeniously, there's this way of arpeggiating the chords, first up and then down throughout, creating a sort of water droplet effect. And it's particularly rich with regard to the accented passing notes, which now become displaced. So it really gives you a fluid and unexpected overall effect, where things always resolve satisfactorily, but never quite at the moment you expect.
After a couple more chromatic and unstable sequences, we reach the next point of stability with this rather grand chordal moment. If we check back into our intensity heat map, you can see yellow turning to orange as the complexity and chromaticism of the texture keeps increasing and we head towards the climax of the piece. After a huge downward scale and a dissonant trill between the flat 9 and the sharp 11 of the A flat chord, the whole passage culminates in this really beautiful and complex downwards run. I have to confess I can't fully work out how this line was put together. If we separate out the upper and lower notes we get a fairly straightforward tune in the upper part. But then the main area of focus in the first part of the bar is the lower line, which moves while the upper notes stay static. In the second half, the focus seems to shift to the upper part, with the lower part outlining an A flat 7 flat 9 chord. It kind of mixes together all the techniques we've talked about. There's the held note at the top, there's the passing notes, and then there's the chromatic sliding down to a point. These kind of moments are the ones I love trying to learn from. How do we make something as intricate and intriguing as that? And well, for this one, at the time of writing, I'm, I'm still figuring it out. It's a fitting culmination. And this is a classic climactic moment, two thirds through the piece, the kind of golden section, if you like. So again, despite being a tranquil lullaby, the whole piece is really underpinned by a quite strong dramatic arc with this moment as its climax. And from here on, it's all about gearing up for the ending. The two chord pattern finally breaks down and the one chord now becomes a dominant seventh, a passage that seems to almost just allow the piano to resonate. It sounds almost like an overtone series. And then after a final cadence, we end up repeating the opening melody, but now over an unchanging tonic chord. Hey Dorian, recognize me? Yeah, I know. I have short hair now, so I don't know if you recognize me, but... You know, the hardest part about recording that piece wasn't all the runs in the right hand that David talked about. It was actually the left hand, because there were two alternating chords. For a long time, I keep forgetting which is when. So that was actually the hardest part for me. Anyway, I hope you learned something about Chopin's pursuits. The ironic thing is that I actually did not know or think about any of these things that David talked about when I was playing that piece.